Yeah, so I'm James, for anyone that I don't work with. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys for Liverpool's first uh, Magento meetup. So I'm TTL at Session Digital. I've been here for almost two years now, um, which is good. And I'm on one of the Magento 2 projects for these guys, uh, which has been a pretty good experience over the past two, maybe three months that we've been actually working on it, and however many months that I've been involved in it during its pre beta phase, which has been good. So what I'm going to talk about is what to expect as a developer. I'll did a great job of talking about what to expect as a business person, what's coming in Magento 2, but what does it mean for us developer folks? How much are we going to have to relearn what's new, what's the same, and what do, uh, what do we need to really do? So the most important thing is to look at what's changed since Magento 1. So Magento 1 is nearly eight years old when it was born. I was still young. I still pretend I'm young, but um, <laughs> I'm getting older every year, as my wife says. So the biggest thing that changed since Magento, uh, Magento 1 came out, is PHP. PHP has gone through so many iterations since, and it's impacted how the architect architecture and how we look at Magento. So if we look at what's changed in that time frame, in 2012 we got Composer that came out to us. It wasn't available in Magento 1. Namespaces, it's hard to think of a time of Magento, uh, PHP without a namespace there. Traits, nowadays it's just, oh, we use a trait and we use code, but that, that wasn't there. That's a big improvement. Generators, type hinting, all the stuff that we're now taking for granted in PHP 5.3, 5.4 and above just, just wasn't there. So it's, it's for Magento 1 developers that have lived in just the Magento 1 world, it's all that stuff that we need to try and catch up on if, if we just focus on Magento 1. And how we actually build these systems has changed quite a lot. Eight years ago, there wasn't really much of a concept of the cloud. It was there, but it was sort of the cloud, really. Whereas it's now changed. We've got VPSs, which are just there. That's the normal now. You don't really tend to buy bare metal anymore. You buy space on a VPS. Docker's making a massive inroad into the way that we hold systems now because it's so easy to throw away containers. And Amazon and Rackspace are really investing a lot of money in how the cloud operates. TDD, with how we actually build systems, it was around when Magento 1 came, but it was not in a mature state that we can call TDD. The HP unit was, was there, but it was really hard to use. We're still trying to play catch up in the PHP world with Java, .NET, systems like that. BDD was, was still a pipe dream that didn't really exist um, in that time. And DDD was, it was probably in Eric Evans' head, but nobody really understood it by him. I don't think anyone still does. And getting back to Magento, so eight years ago, and even up to now, with how we installed Magento 1 was, was pretty archaic really. So to deploy a Magento 1 solution, it was a monolith. You took the code, you put it somewhere else. There was no way of composing it. It was, these are my files that make Magento run. Let's take them and put them there. Install them with GUI, do whatever we need to do, but that was it. It was Magento or nothing. Um, and it worked. But now we've got Composer. So for anybody that doesn't know, Composer is a way of managing PHP packages. It's a command line tool that can deal with packages that we want. We can say Composer and grab us this library. Or we can use Composer to say, get me this package, but I only want this version, or I want this range of versions. And it's, it's so that we don't have to contain all of our files locally. We can let Composer manage packages for us, which, which is really, really cool. So, how do we use that Magento 1, or Magento 2, sorry. So to create a project now, instead of having to go to Magento.com, waiting 15 minutes to do a download in the Tarball, then faffing around extracting it, adding it to source control, and doing all that stuff, we just go to the command line, it's called Compose and Create Project, give it our stability, say we don't want to install, call the version we want, such so Magento, Magento Framework, and give it the folder name, and it's, it's done. Uh, I mean, not ideal for merchants that don't know the command line. There are alternatives for that. You can still go and grab a tarball if you want. But for enterprise grade clients that have got developers either working for them in house or as, as clients like we do, this is how it's going to be done from the future. And Magento 2 is more modular, so we can get the entire framework. Or if we just wanted to use the Braintree module, 
we can grab the brain tree module, we can use Magento 2 as a CMS, we can use Magento 1 as purely a checkout if we want. I mean, there are some caveats around what we can and can't use, but the idea of them decoupling each component is there. And that gives us a composer.json file which we can all use and, and, and run away. This is our composer.json where we can lock it to different versions. And Composer can actually do much more. So I've just said that we can install packages from it, which is, is great, a way of not having to go to the web and download stuff, source forge is distant memory, thank God. But Composer can actually tell us where to download stuff from. It's got packages, this massive repository of so many packages that we can actually include in Magento 2. If we need to use Bitcoin, there's a Bitcoin library, we can pull it into our project. We're not having to write as much code as we did in Magento 1. We can just use Composer to find these packages, daytime, calculations. The community in PHP is really active in writing all these packages for us. We've got package versioning. So instead of us having to manage what versions of packages we installed, and then having to spend time saying, oh, we want to upgrade our version of Zend, or we want to upgrade this, it's, it's done for us by a, by a composer. And dependence management, that's all brought in by a composer as a freebie just for using the tool. And then, like I say, if we want to use a daytime library, we can just say composer require, and there we go, it's in, it's in our project. Magento 2 uses what's called as SR Autoloader, so it's instantly available in our code base for any of the developers. Code example for anyone that wants to geek out, or got any developers as well, it's that easy. Instead of having to download into lib, hop around, we just include namespace, reference it with the I, and away we go. No more lib versioning, screaming, swearing, hiding under the desk like I did many years ago. Not anymore, Rich. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not wasting time. <laughs> but, uh, but that's all we need to do. And I say versioning in Composer is massive. So we can say that we want exact versions. So if, like, imagine this for external packages, but also packages that we build internally. So I know a lot of clients and merchants build their own individual frameworks. They can still actively develop, but we can say we only want that stable version while the team go away and build it. We can say we want these versions, or we can say we actually want a range of versions. We can say we want between one and two, which is really good. It's a really powerful way of working with versioning. It's a way of PHP catching up with the enterprise grade level of what we need to do. We can do wildcards. We can say anything one dot, two dot, three dot, just a way of versioning software. And we can say next significant releases. So if we want to not be on the bleeding edge, we can say give me something that is really stable. And this all really depends on if we use what's called semantic version or sembar, where we use a major version, a minor version, and a patch version. Magento 2 has adopted this a lot recently. They never used to, it was just we'll give you release candidate X, Y, and Z. Whereas now we know that we're on major version 2, minor version X, and patch version Y. So we've got a little bit more confidence in deploying Magento 2 projects because we know what's going into it. We know what we're upgrading. One of the massive new features, so anyone that's dealt with developing for a Magento 1 project or a module knows how hard it was to take that module and move it to another place. I forgot so many times about ETC XML files or I always miss something and it was hard to tell that you miss something. Modules now are decoupled, so you keep them in a single place. A module has got its theme files and it's XML in a single place, all the code's there in one folder. And it means that all these books that we've seen on the cool kids' bookshelves and, and all the, the cool places, we can actually start applying those principles to how we build Magento 2 modules. So it helps us, like I can say, decoupling modules, great. How does that help us? Well, cleaner code, cleaner code's more cost-effective code, reusable packages, we can use it over multiple projects if you're a merchant, multiple stores. It's testable. Magento 1 testing was really hard. It's now easier. It's easier to read for developers and it's so much easier to maintain. 
decoupled code means it's in a single place, it's easier for us to manage and more cost effective, faster to change. We couldn't do this in Magento 1 for many reasons. We had no dependency injection container. We, at session, found a way of getting a fake DI in there. But it worked, it's great, and we're actually using it on projects, but it was cumbersome. There was a mage god class that we all love and hate at the same time. It was damn hard to test. I mean, we've got the guys down in, in London, Hungary, and Manchester that built mage tests that support BHAP mage and mage spec, which is really good, but it's, it's still hard to get over that hurdle. And there was a real effort to decouple logic. It was just a case of it's a Magento 1 module. We will decouple it, we'll work with it, we'll do our best, but there's that Magento 1 in there that makes it acceptable for, for a Magento 1 solution. So, DI, I mentioned it there, a bit of dependency injection. What does it actually mean? Well, <laughs> I got carried away. As soon as I saw DI in Magento 2, I was like, wow, this is amazing, I'm gonna get gonna do what all the Symphony kids do. So I threw everything in there. I was like, yeah, it's DI, I can throw Magento framework, I'll throw all this shit in there. Let's let's get carried away, let's 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 do it the proper way, like Marcelo and the guys that tell us what we should do. And then Marcelo took him to one side and he was like, yeah, just, just calm down, B James. You're getting carried away, that's it's a really bad code smell. And I thought it was great, but no, adding all these dependencies is just as bad as coupling my module to Magento 1. It's, uh, it's, it's far from ideal. But because we've got DI, we can spot that now. It's a way of us telling what, what we're actually injecting. And it replaces the Mage God class, so we don't have to rely on Mage Singleton all the time. We can actually call our dependencies that we've injected in. Uh, we can overuse dependencies. I did it. Many people have done it before, and many people are still going to do it unless we, we educate them with training, blog posts, and uh, their program. But it enables composition. Magento 1 was all about inheritance. And as we're slowly learning, favor composition over inheritance. A little example of what it looks like for DI. Um, if anyone's seen Magento 1 code, it's always mage, colon, colon, whatever, which is, trust me, it's bad. Whereas now we can just call the instances and the class is responsible for having the instance injected into it, which is, it's good. Um, and there you can see we're calling the, the new class that we want to call. use it, use the class as we need it. And it helps us in code wise with responsibility. Each class is like a person really. Each staff the responsibility to do one thing. And maybe more than one thing as a person, but we should be trying to do one thing well at a time and then, then moving on. And it can help us like swap out the concrete implementation. One of the big things that we hear all the time is we use MySQL as our database. Let's try and code in such a way that maybe we can move to Mongo, maybe in the future that's gonna be a feasible option. With cache backends, let's code to interfaces so that we can use Redis or we can swap over to Memcache. It should be an infrastructure decision, not a code decision. We shouldn't need to spend time coding just to change out what hardware we're using behind the scenes. And for testing, it helps us mock dependencies, which makes unit testing possible. But back to Magento 2. This is how the eye looks in Magento 2. So we still have to pass the parameters over just because it uses reflection to work out what classes are required. But we pass it by the constructor so that when it generates the container it knows what dependencies to inject. And what is actually crazy but is really cool at the same time is it's not only objects that we can inject in. So Symfony, as far as I'm aware, can only accept objects as arguments that can be passed into the, the DI container. In Magento 2, we can actually inject strings, variables, extension names, whatever we want really. So this is an array that we're injecting in, which is pretty cool for when we're setting up configuration variables, accessing the admin, we can say, inject this so we can swap out, we can change it, we can mock what values are actually going in there which is, is 
still crazy, but, but pretty good. It's, it's, it's there for what Magenta 2 needs, and it makes life so much easier. And then we can see what we're expecting, our extensions, which is just an array of XML. And the way that we call it is just by PHP, because they get injected in as a, an array. We just call it and use it in PHP as we would, as if it was an object. And we can just check what types are allowed. And Magento 2 core uses that quite a lot. And it means that we can have separate instances of objects. We're taking the responsibility of creating the class away from the class that's using it, which is, is what we should be doing as developers. We should make sure that instantiation is part of the object that needs to call it. Far easier to test. And separation of concerns, which is it's just makes cleaner code. We know that class does a, not A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Getting on to testing, so I've, talk, I've talked about all the benefits of heading to injection and said that yeah, it makes testing easier, but how does it make testing easier? We know that we should be testing all things. PHP has been a little bit behind on how .NET, Java guys um, have been testing, but we're catching up. We've got PHP Unit, PHP Spec, Codeception, BHAP, a raft of tools now that make testing easier and Gentel 2 enables and actually teaches us that we should be testing. Gentel 2 comes with integration tests, 100% code coverage unit tests, take that for what it is, but it's it's there and we should be doing the same. So PHP spec now works fantastically well with Gentel 2. All we need to do Instead of having to have mage spec, we're still going to need mage spec to manage some of the dependencies and the actual code generation that mage spec does. But now we can just say in a Magento 2 application, I want this to be a double, which is a mock, of this. And that, that's a test for an actual piece of Magento 2 code. It's that easy to actually write it. And the benefits are now of the entire Magento 2 EP ecosystem is the composer can help us create packages we can reuse what community members have built we're not limited to just the magento community we've now got the php community as a whole dependency injection or di is is a must we cannot use it in magento one people have built ways of, of uh, taking a magento one module using an automated tool and bringing it over to magento two but it comes with a lot of baggage we should be embracing dependency injection we need to be careful how to use it. Don't fall into the same trap as I did and include the entire Magento framework as it'll be slow, it'll be silly, and you'll get laughed at. Testing, we should now really test our, our code. If we're working for enterprise clients and we're not testing it, we're being a little bit irresponsible as developers. So it's easier for us to test. Let's embrace it and do it. And decouple our modules. Yes, it's easier to share the code with, between projects, Yes, it's easier to share it between sites, but let's make sure it's easier to decouple from framework so that if we do decide that we're a merchant and we want to use um, Magento for our shop, but for our backup house system we use Symfony, let's build a library that works between the two systems and not treat them as two separate systems. And then use service contracts. I've not really touched upon it much, but service contracts in Magento 2 are interfaces, so we can actually use designed by contracts or designed by interfaces to, to code, which is, for anyone that knows, a really great way of moving forward. Yeah, and I just want to say a special thanks to, to Session and all you guys for actually turning up. It's, uh, in Manchester, we've got a little meetup that's been going for a few years now, and it's great to actually see what you guys are doing in Liverpool. It's brilliant. Um, I think we'll keep it up as much as we possibly can because it's you guys that actually make the Gentile what it is. eBay is just a company over there that want to make money, but it's the community and everyone coming together that makes it special. So thanks to you guys for organising it and thanks to you guys for turning up. And, yeah. so, I'm going to quickly run to the bar before any questions. <laughs> No, if anyone's got anything, just shout away or we can chat over a bit.
How was it that you used the defective say injection? How was what, sorry? How was it that you ever used the defective say injection? Was it just too many parameters or was there? Yeah, so I was using DI and I thought um, it was mainly highlighted that my class was doing too much. So I brought in um, request objects, response objects, validation objects, payment gateway. And uh, it was a way of showing that my controller was actually doing far too much. I should have moved that logic out into a service or a module. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. So it's not a problem with the, the DI container itself? The, the no, the DI container actually. So Magento 2 looked at using Symfony 2's DI container, but the way that Magento 2 works, it was too much of a complex scenario for using the DI container from Symfony. Symfony's DI container does a great job at covering vast, expansive projects, but for what Magento 2 needed for its XML generation, its object generation, its proxying, interceptors, which are the new um, observers, it just didn't work quite well, it was too slow. Whereas they implemented it based on concepts from Symfony 2 and the ZMDI container, and it, it's pretty quick. I mean, in production, you have to call generate DI so that you've got the pre-generated uh, DI container on the server. We've got it on our two projects at the minute running at about sub two seconds on a deploy, which for the amount of code that Magento 2's got and the amount of code we've started adding is, is pretty quick. And it helps speed up the execution as well, which is three bonus for it on. Any more? Is that easier uh, New York Magento conference talk? No, so New York next week is going to be connecting and BDD. More Magento one with a bit of Magento too. Hopefully, lots of it. But yeah. No, thanks again for everyone turning up. It's great. We should really get behind it. Thank you. Thank you very much.